check, check. One, two. Check, one, two, three. All good.
Well, welcome to the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm Cliff May. Glad to see you all here today. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to our conversation, Attila, Zarab, and U.S.-Turkish relations, implications of the biggest sanctions, biggest sanctions evasion scheme in recent history, or probably in history entirely. I don't think we're going to find any other, any other time. My FDD colleagues have been following this case closely. Indeed, they were looking at this for a long time before law enforcement even became involved, and perhaps they'll discuss that before law enforcement got wind of it. And they'll no doubt have a wealth of knowledge to share about the case and about what may come next. We have, a, as you probably know, a great Turkey team here at FDD, uh, presided over by Ambassador Edelman. Uh, we also have a great Iran team, and we have CSIF, the uh, which looks at economic warfare, um, the Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. And this is kind of uh, a kind of issue which really takes in all of those various capabilities and expertise. And by the way, if you can't get enough of this, there's a podcast that I did with John and with, uh, with, with Icon and with Merva, and you can find it on our website or on iTunes, and we go over all of that sort of stuff. So with that, I'm glad to hand the conversation over to our moderator today, which is Ambassador Eric Edelman former U.S. Ambassador to Turkey, current senior advisor here at FDD. And just before I do, by way of housekeeping, I should note today's event will be live streamed. I encourage guests here or online to join in on today's conversation on Twitter at FDD. And I'd also ask that you please silence your cell phones. And with that, Eric, thank you. Over to you. Cliff, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be back here at FDD and particularly great to be with this team. Um, I think it's uh, unfortunate um, that we're meeting at a time, well, it's fortunate, I should say, that we're meeting today, but it's unfortunate that the circumstances uh, are what they are. Uh, just this week, uh, Freedom House uh, issued its annual report on freedom in the world, uh, and in the course of their review of uh, the state of freedom uh, globally, uh, they moved uh, Turkey from... Uh, the category of partially unfree to unfree. Um, that is something that ought to be a matter of concern to everybody uh, in the United States who cares about Turkey and those of us who care a lot about the uh, U.S.-Turkish relationship. Uh, one of the major uh, events that uh, I think has driven Turkey in a direction where rule of law is uh, called into question is the very case that we will be uh, discussing today, um, and uh, I think nobody has been more uh, institutionally concerned about the fate of uh, democracy and freedom in Turkey uh, than FDD and the team of folks uh, here who uh, work on this, and nobody in the United States of America, I believe, in institutionally in the think tank world, has followed this case as closely as the people uh, on this uh, panel. So let me uh, briefly introduce all of our panel members um, and then uh, get right into the discussion of this. First, uh, Mark Dubowitz is the uh, CEO of FDD and the head of the Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance that Cliff just mentioned a minute ago. And Mark served uh, as an expert witness at the trial in New York. Uh, Jonathan Shanzer, um, uh, Senior Vice President for Research at FDD, uh, also part of the leadership team at the uh, Center. Uh, also. Um, uh, scheduled to be an expert witness at the trial in the in the event uh, wasn't wasn't called, but I think still has plenty to share uh, that'll be of interest to this audience. Uh, to my immediate right, Dr. Aykan Erdemir, senior fellow uh, at FDD, uh, a former parliamentarian. Um, uh, he was mentioned in the trial. Um, he may want to talk about that, um, uh, and. Uh, 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 or mentioned during the course of the trial uh, by Turkish prosecutors, uh, as have been another a, a large group of other Americans as well, uh, including some who are in the audience. Um, and uh, we'll be discussing some of that. And then finally, um, uh, my colleague uh, and uh, occasional co-author, Merve Tayarolu, who's a research analyst here, um, and she attended every day of the trial. So uh, I don't think there is a... An, a group of people in Washington 
better suited to discuss this with us than this group. Let me uh, kick things off, Mark, by turning uh, to you, because what we're dealing with here is, as Cliff said, uh, arguably the largest sanctions evasion effort uh, in history. And just, um, just to give people a sense of scope, uh, an earlier um, effort uh, to bust U.S. sanctions on Iran led the Justice Department to levy one of the largest fines ever on a foreign bank, BNP Paribas, in France was, I believe, fined $8 billion. And uh, Mark, hopefully you and Jonathan and uh, I can America can put uh, the current uh, effort we're talking about into some perspective using that as a kind of rough order of magnitude metric. But Mark, if you could describe the sanctions architecture and the loopholes that were exploited here to help people orient themselves, that would be great. Great. Well, thank you very much, Eric, and, and thanks to all of you for coming today and certainly to, to my phenomenal colleagues here who've been tracking this case uh, along with, with me and the Iran team for, for many years. I guess to situate this case, one needs to go back to sort of 2011 to 2013 and, and, and look at the sanctions architecture from Iran's perspective at the time. As, as many of you remember, that period of time you saw a number of really tough U.S. and European sanctions imposed on, on the Iranian regime. It started basically in 2010 with uh, a bill called the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Investment Act, um, which imposed sanctions on foreign banks for doing business with designated Iranian banks and actually threatened to cut off the correspondent banking relationships that those foreign banks have with U.S. banks, which would basically prevent them from providing U.S. dollar transactions and banking services. From 2010, 2011, 2012, you saw new legislation going after uh, Iran's central bank, Iran's oil exports. 2012, dozens of Iranian banks were kicked off the SWIFT financial messaging system. In many respects now, Iran it was denied access to the global financial system. You saw sanctions against the National Iranian Oil Company, the National Iranian uh, Gas Company, a number of other companies that were involved in Iran's oil and, and natural gas sector. And you saw sanctions that uh, were passed in 2012, but then were implemented um, in 2013 against Iran's ability to trade in, uh, in precious metals. Uh, along with that, the Iranians were not only having difficulty selling their oil and financing those oil transactions, but to the extent they sold oil abroad, countries that were buying that oil had to deposit the oil revenues in these escrow accounts. <coughs> which were effectively locked up in different countries. And Iran could only use that money sitting in those escrow accounts to buy local goods in that country that were not sanctionable under US law or buy humanitarian goods abroad. Right. So that's kind of the, the basic sanctions architecture. And from Iran's perspective, they were now effectively cut off from the global financial system. They were prohibited from uh, trading in, in US dollars their oil exports were being cut. To the extent that they could sell any oil, the revenues were being restricted. By 2013, Iran was sort of down to about $20 billion in accessible foreign exchange reserves. So it was a significant drop and for a country with a $400 billion plus GDP. $20 billion was um, on the verge of a balance of payments crisis and the inability of Iran to actually have enough foreign exchange reserves to buy and, and pay for imports. So this is what Iran faced in terms of the U.S. and international sanctions architecture. And Iran, uh, along with Turkey and along with some of the characters you're going to hear about, conceived of a scheme to try and get that money out of those accounts. Now, with respect to Turkey, Iran was selling oil and, and natural gas to Turkey. And the revenues were collecting in a bank called Hulk Bank. This is Turkey's second largest uh, state-owned bank. And the money was collecting, and again, it was being restricted. So Iran could only use that money to buy things in Turkey. And it was very frustrating for Iran because it was running out of things to buy. And there wasn't enough to actually spend in Turkey. Except um, the Iranians, along with this uh, character who you're going to hear a lot more about, Reza Zarab, and some of the senior banking executives at Hulk Bank, conceived of a very interesting scheme. And, and with that, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks. And the scheme was essentially this. 
is go into that account at Hulk Bank, effectively withdraw that money, transfer it into some other accounts that Reza Zarab uh, owned, and take that money, go down to the, the souk in, in Istanbul, the grand, uh, into the Grand Bazaar, and buy gold bars. Put them in gym bags, go to the airport, fly to Dubai, and uh, then sell that gold, uh, get, uh, get Emirati currency, and then exchange that Emirati currency for US dollars, transfer it to Iranian accounts, and then the Iranians now have access to billions and billions of dollars of foreign exchange reserves. And this was the scheme that we had identified, um, at least parts of it, back in 2013 when we did a report on this strange phenomenon of Turkish gold exports that were increasing dramatically between 2012 and 2013, we had identified about $13 billion of Turkish gold that was being exported to the UAE. Now, how did we find this out? Did we hire um, detectives? Were we doing deep forensic research? Do we have sources in the Turkish and Iranian government? Well, actually, no. No, we actually looked at Turkish customs data because the Turks every month were declaring this as part of their export data. And we'll talk about why that was the case. Um, and obviously, there was, there was strong interest for Turkey to do so, and obviously strong interest for the Iranians to get their hold on their hands on the gold and on the dollars. <clears throat> well, I'm going to turn now to uh, Jonathan and Merve to uh, help us understand um, the principal actors in this case. Uh, Reza Zarab, who uh, Mark has talked about, uh, certainly got a lot of public attention because uh, his name was raised repeatedly by President Erdogan in phone calls with President Trump, discussions with President Obama, uh, making it very clear this was someone who uh, the Turkish government wanted to see uh, released from U.S. custody and uh, did not want to see go to trial. Uh, in the event, he ended up pleading guilty, and the trial turned on um, the Hulk Bank executive. Jonathan and Mervey, can you tell us about uh, Attila and, and Reza Zarab, who are they, and, and uh, how did they put this scheme together? Would you like to start? Sure. <laughs> I thought you would want to start off introducing Zarab. So Reza Zarab is a, is a Turkish-Iranian businessman, gold trader, and he was using Turkey. His, his name um, is well known in Turkey, in part, and this is how I'm going to introduce some of the other characters that I think we should be mentioning here, in December 2013 because of a huge corruption scandal, which I'm sure many of you have heard about before. Um, in this corruption scandal, Turkish police and prosecutors had looked into Zarab's bribe relationships with some Turkish ministers, including the economy minister, the interior minister, the EU minister. And that's how the name became popular in Turkey, along with these, with these ministers and the massive amounts of bribes that he had paid them over time. Now, what the Turkish corruption scandal didn't focus on too much was the actual Iran's, Iran sanctions evasion part of it, so, what, which is what we are looking for because there are two stories here that is of relevant, relevance to Turkey. One part is the sanctions evasion, which we care about more because it has more um, global geopolitical implications. And the other part is concerns Turkish domestic politics. When Zarab's bribe relationships with these uh, ministers came out in December 2013, it was a massive scandal. People in Turkey really thought this might bring down Erdogan's government, which had been in power at this point for 10 years. Um, but then it didn't. Uh, there were some reshuffling measures going on in, in the Turkish judiciary, and Erdogan was essentially able to uh, crush the investigation, acquit everyone, including Zarab and including the minister's <coughs> sons who had been jailed because they were the ones carrying the bribe money and et cetera. So when in 2014, just a few months after the scandal, um, all of these actors were acquitted and the corruption scandal seemed to have been gone away, and two years later we have Zarab coming to Miami and get arrested by the United States for actually what he did in terms of the sanctions evasion, which Turkey hadn't paid too much attention to at the time. It was again a major um, political interest for Turkey because everybody thought in this trial we might also get some information about the corruption that, concerns Erdo that concerned Erdogan's government at the time, and we did. Um, 
<clears throat> well, what, what I would actually add to that is that so we learned about the corruption scandal in late 2013. Several months later, you have a leaked prosecutor's report, uh, the Istanbul prosecutor's report. And what it does is it actually starts to shed light on some of these transactions that Zarab is engaged in. Uh, it's everything that the Istanbul police know uh, about this scheme. And it turns out that it wasn't just gold. That, uh, that, that the Turks and the Iranians were dealing with, but they also began a second phase uh, of, this, uh, of this sanctions evasion scheme that gets into uh, fictitious invoicing, where they are uh, selling um, uh, raw sugar, lentils, chickpeas, um, and it's, it's rather remarkable because in some cases there is no product to sell, so it's, it's false invoicing. Uh, in some cases, maybe we, we don't know, but uh, we're even just looking at the prices. Um, it's classic money laundering, over invoicing, where brown sugar is being sold for four or five hundred dollars a kilo. Um, that's going to be some pretty good brown sugar, right? Um, and, and so we see all of this laid out. We see violations of the SWIFT sanctions that Mark had mentioned, where the Iranians are technically supposed to be off of SWIFT almost entirely, and yet we see these um, these transactions go through SWIFT, and there's a little note at the bottom uh, where it says, you know, basically, um, don't worry, this is consistent with the SWIFT regulations, please allow this to go through, and apparently it did. So um, we see all of this laid out in a 300-page uh, report, which Merve actually spent an entire weekend, it was her first weekend uh, at FDD, and she spent the entire weekend translating it from Turkish to English, um, and um, uh, at any rate, uh, we could not get traction on any of this. We briefed members of Congress, Treasury, State. No one seemed to be interested in all of this. Um, and by 2015, we sort of let it drop. And that's when, in 2016, we were very surprised to see that when Zarab came to the United States to actually go on a Disney World vacation with his, uh, with his wife, child, and nanny, he uh, arrives at Miami International Airport and the Department of Justice arrests him. Uh, for massive sanctions violation and bank fraud. Um, after that is when we see one more name added to this, and this is uh, uh, Mehmed Hakan Attila. Uh, this is a mid-level, well, maybe not mid-level, deputy CEO of Hulk Bank. He, is, uh, he comes to the United States on business and uh, found himself arrested as well. And there's actually very dramatic uh, video of the FBI agent uh, letting him know that he's been arrested, and he's completely shocked that he would be arrested for this. Um, and we learned in the course of the trial exactly why, and he was very much involved, very knowledgeable in this scheme. Um, Jonathan, Merve, would you like to talk a little bit more about the trial itself, since both of you were there for uh, the entirety of the trial? How did so? Zarab, in the end of the day, <coughs> uh, decided, uh, despite having hired some uh, fairly pricey uh, advocates to lobby for his release here in Washington, as opposed to plead his case in court, uh, decided that discretion was the better part of valor and uh, pled guilty. Um, how did this play out at trial? What, what about his testimony in addition to the documentary evidence that you all had been uh, working with as well as the prosecutors uh, over the years? How, how did all of this come together at the trial? I, look, it, the only way to describe it is that it was just blockbuster testimony. Um, Zarab gets up and, and really takes on the persona of a Harvard business professor um, and, and with dry erase boards starts to just sketch out the entire scheme, all the different banks, the companies, the individuals. He's got a flow chart. He's got dotted lines. He's got arrows. It's really like the movie Beautiful Mind. I mean, you really, you see this guy, you know, laying it all out there. And he's so got Sanctions it Evasion 101. That's right. Well, I think it's kind of more of the 400 level, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the advanced course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> got it. Uh, but he's, he's laying it all out there and you know he's talking about uh, the, the, uh, the fictitious and food invoicing and medicine he's looking at, at, uh, at Turkey he's looking at non-Turkish banks he is naming everyone and more importantly he's naming individuals in the Turkish government Zafar Chalian the uh, the economy minister he says just point blank that he provided 50 million dollars in bribes to this minister in order to ensure that this uh, sanction scheme continues. Well, actually, there's, I mean, there's actually a spreadsheet that was put in as an exhibit. Where, I mean, he's so meticulous in his record keeping that he has a spreadsheet that's basically bribes. <laughs> and it has a list of people in the Turkish government and the amount of money that he's paid them 
and when he paid them and the currency that he's paid them in. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. So I think you're right, an advanced course in sanctions, busting, money laundering, <coughs> but also pretty brazen. Yeah. So just to, to be clear, so uh, Minister Chalian, uh, according to Zarb, received 50 million. Was that all for Chalian, or was that to be spread among other ministers and government employees? Do we know? My understanding is that it was for him. I think that was the implication. So there were Zara. separate line items for, That's you know. Right. And there are actually, separate spreadsheets right. for, and for the other <laughs> If you look at the evidence in, uh, in the DOJ portal, it actually also shows, I mean, actual wire transfers uh, to individuals that were on the take. I mean, it's all out there very, very clearly. And uh, it's for this reason we were so frustrated. You could see elements of this emerge from the various data points that we were drawing from. Uh, and we were shocked that the U.S. government wasn't moving on this. Eventually they did, but it wasn't the actors that we thought. We thought it would be, you know, the White House. We thought it would be Treasury or State. In the end, it was the Department of Justice. I mean, if I could add to that, Eric, so t in terms of frustration, so we had identified uh, what we called the golden loophole, which was in sort of 2012, the Obama administration had passed an executive order which prohibited Iran from trading in precious metals, but only the government of Iran. So we had all this data we put out in a report, and we went to the Obama administration. And we said, look, there's $13 billion of gold that's moving out of Turkey to the UAE. It's clear that this is part of some sanctions-busting scheme. Um, we think this needs to be investigated. And we also think you need to close the golden loophole to ensure that there's an absolute prohibition. It's not just on the government of Iran. It's on all Iranian entities and individuals trading in gold. And the response from the Obama administration, John remembers this, was, we don't think so. We think actually um, this is private gold. Iranians love their jewelry. And we said 13, $13 billion dollars worth. <laughs> $13 billion dollars of jewelry. And they said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's jewelry that's moving. So we were frustrated. I mean, it was clear that this wasn't jewelry moving, that this was part of some kind of sanctions busting money laundering scheme. At that point, we didn't know the extent of it. We didn't know how big it was. But it was clear that it was big enough. And um, I mean, it, one, you know, one plausible theory, and it's only a theory, is that remember that period of 2012 to 2013? Does anybody remember what was going on in terms of Iranian-US negotiations? That was the back channel period. Right? This was the period where the United States was negotiating with Iran in Oman. Right? This was the back channel that eventually resulted in the more formal negotiations that then resulted in the interim agreement and then the JCPOA. We didn't know at the time that there were back channel negotiations going on, but clearly um, to us there was a reluctance, at least on the part of the Obama administration, to really crack down on this sanctions busting scheme. Why that reluctance? One, one possible theory, again, I don't have any evidence of this, one possible theory is they were allowing the gold trade to continue to incentivize the Iranians to stay at the table and continue those back channel negotiations. <coughs> So at the trial, we have, John, uh, you, what you're des described as blockbuster testimony about a major sanctions evasion scheme, uh, moving the, the gold out, the fictitious invoicing, money laundering. Kind of sounds almost like for those who watch Netflix show Ozark, it sounds like a Middle Eastern kind of Ozark with fictitious invoices. Um, bribes to ministers. Uh, uh, what, what else did we learn from the, the trial? And well, I think the, the, entire, the trial lasted about three and a half weeks, and I, uh, I like to say we learned a lot every day of it from all the testimonies, but Zarab's testimonies lasted the first seven full days of the trial, and that's when we had more than 100 Turkish journalists, um, uh, all sorts of citizen journalists, Turkish people living in New York, Turkish people living in, in the United States who had come just to see the trial because it, it, it was very much conceived in Turkey as a major trial for Turkish-American relations, but also for implications regarding the Turkish government. So um, every day of, of Zarab's trial was um, a, a, a a full circus. People started trials with the hearings would start at 9:30 a.m. People would start lining up outside the courtroom at 7:45. Um, many people wouldn't be able to get in, so they had to broadcast it in, in other rooms, um, and they had to request for other rooms to be open in this. And this was this was just the first two weeks. And and so uh, Zara presumably testified under oath that all of these underlying documents, including spreadsheets and whatnot, were in his own hand, were his documents, in in which he took complete and, the, cognizance the, and the, of. It, there were I mean there was a huge amount 
uh, we had an opportunity to review some of these documents in, in, in advance of the trial, and, and they were just, you know, I mean, just stacks of documents, and, and it all pointed in basically the same direction. Uh, it was, I, I can say that it was, it was a little bit frustrating from, from our perspective to see Zara plea out because he was such a central figure in all of this. Um, you know, obviously it was gratifying to hear him fess up to all of this. And, and, and I think, to, to be honest, it probably was, was gratifying to him to come clean with all of this. You imagine he's been bottling this up for so long, uh, working at the highest levels of the, you know, with the Iranians as well as the Turks. He's carrying a lot of secrets with him. He just spills his guts in front of uh, a Manhattan jury. But he yeah. pled out. I mean, we're not, we don't know whether he'll serve time. We assume he will. But he pled out to seven counts uh, of sanctions violations and bank fraud, et cetera. So we assume that he's going to be sentenced, spend some time. And then I, then I assume that he will end up in witness protection because there are a lot of angry Iranian and Turkish regime Turkish officials. Who, sure. Um, <laughs> and, we're, not, uh, we're not excited to hear and, about um, And Mr. Atala, um, and the, the Hulk Bank executive, he is convicted of what, and he was acquitted at least of one charge. What, what explain the verdict? So he's got five counts against him, or four counts against him for conspiracy, various conspiracies, uh, and one count of bank fraud, uh, and he was acquitted of money laundering. Um, I, I don't know exactly why the jury decided on, on exactly what they did, but he's facing, uh, you know, a good number of charges, and it will be very interesting to see what sentencing looks like. He actually was found guilty on conspiracy for money laundering, but, but not, not guilty on the actual money laundering, and I think that's because of his role as deputy general manager. And with that, I just wanted to mention that one person, a key person that we haven't yet gotten to talking about is the CEO of Hulk Bank, the former CEO of Hulk Bank, Suleyman Aslan, who very clearly played the most important role in all of this. And, and when we, Jonathan mentioned the, the economy minister's bribes, the, the massive bribes that he got, he actually seemed in the trial that, uh, based on what Zarab told us, he would have been fine not getting any bribes from all of this. He was happy with this scheme. The person who was uncomfortable with it and wanted to get bribes from uh, some payment for his service from Zarab was the CEO of the bank, Suleyman Aslan, who, um, as we learned in the trial, complained to Zarab about many things, one of them being Americans breathing down his nose about the sanctions evasion. and and literally would ask Zarab for bribes because, well, there has to be some price for doing all this. And, and so compared to his role in it, Attila's role seems very small, uh, um, very minor. And, and, and I want to close out this part of the discussion by a asking this one question and then moving to a larger question that uh, Icon and Merve can maybe address, which is why, you know, why the government and President Erdogan would have agreed to this uh, to this scheme and uh, how much uh, President Erdogan and his family are potentially personally implicated in this. But uh, there are still outstanding indictments, is that correct? Who, who else is uh, under indictment and, and could presumably at some point be brought to there the are, bar of justice? There, are, there are two, uh, two Iranian uh, gold traders. There are a few others from, uh, from Zarab's network, Chalian himself. Uh, I'm not sure. Is Aslan uh, mm -hmm. also? He's yes. also part of it. I yeah. think there are nine total, uh, out of and, and only two that that actually stood trial. Um, the only th the other thing that I was just going to add, and it's a, it's a you know a wild anecdote, but Aslan, you know, we talk about the bribes that he was taking from Zara. Well, we got a little sense of of what he was taking when police raided his home uh, after the corruption scandal erupted, and they went in and they found shoe boxes with millions of dollars in cash in his home. Um, so, you, you know, we, we, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Turkish authorities had a clear sense of what he was up to, and yet none of these people actually had to face justice in Turkey. It was really remarkable. You have this very overt um, uh, sort of string of financial crimes, and the Turks didn't seem to care. Uh, it was kind of a remarkable thing to see the American wheels of justice turning on this so many years later. And Eric, just if I could say one more thing sure. from an Iranian Please. perspective, and before we, we, we talk about Turkey, for, for hopefully the rest of the panel. Um, just remember, from an Iranian perspective, if the Turkish prosecutor's uh, number is correct, and it seems that it's pretty close, um, Iran was able to get away with probably over $100 billion from this scheme. I mean, that's massive. Right? This is at a time where we're trying to squeeze the Iranian regime, increase le economic leverage between 2012, 2013, get the Iranians to the table to negotiate, we're trying to, we would assume, enhance our leverage. 
Um, Iran is down to $20 billion in foreign exchange reserves, a $400 billion economy. And we're trying to cut them off from the financial system, decrease their oil exports, cut them off swift, and yet they get their hands on over $100 billion of money from, uh, from the sanctions busting scheme. This isn't, I mean, this isn't just a loophole right, in U.S. sanctions law. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a massive this is a it's, a lot of damn jewelry. Um, it's a lot of damn jewelry. It's a lot of damn jewelry. Mark, just you know, uh, on that point, before we turn to this, could you put this in perspective? So you're saying 100 billion in benefit to Iran from this sanctions busting scheme. How much did they benefit from BNP Paribas? Do we think just to give you know, help us put this kind of in perspective? Yeah. So. Um, so the BNP Paribas, remember the fine was $8.9 billion, and BNP Paribas um, was threatened with losing their, their access to um, the U.S. financial system. I, I can't remember the exact number that BNP Paribas was processing because they were processing uh, transactions not only for Iran but for you know, narco-terrorists and a number of other rogue regimes. But it was in the, it was in the tens of billions of dollars. If, if, if the U.S. government wanted to go after Hulk Bank in the same way, for fines and or forfeiture, um, one would hope, one would expect that the fines would be significant because this really was, as Cliff described, I mean, it's one of the largest sanctions busting schemes certainly that I'm aware of. And you know, we, we, as part of the JCPOA, there was a lot of criticism in this town that we released $100 billion to Iran in those oil revenues, and that's the same oil revenues that are trapped in those accounts. Well, they got $100 billion as part of the JCPOA. They got $100 billion as part of this sanctions busting scheme. That's $200 billion. And now they're also free to sell their oil and, and do auto deals and energy deals. So when you look at the JCPOA in its entirety and you include this, we gave them hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief in exchange for a nuclear deal. And I'm sure people in, their, in the audience have their own opinion on how good the nuclear deal was. but. That's, a, that's massive sanctions relief for this regime. Yeah, and, and just a caveat, it will be up to $100 billion or maybe even 110 We don't have exact numbers. It's not like they went to Ernst & Young and settled up at the end of all of this. And, right, so we, uh, we, we have a sense that it's probably somewhere between 30 and $110 billion. Uh, I've seen uh, estimates from journalists who were covering the trial that they thought it was $150 billion. I think that sounds on the high end. Uh, I think $30 billion sounds very low. I think it's in the, in the upper tens is, I think, probably the best way of putting it if you want to be conservative, but who knows. Very good. Okay, um, let's move on to both uh, uh, two other topics, and then I want to get uh, our, our audience involved um, with their questions. Um, first, uh, Icon and Mervik, can you talk about uh, the President Erdogan's motives, the government of Turkey's motives in all this, and the potential fallout, and then maybe we can talk about uh, the impact on U.S.-Turkish uh, relations, uh, the impact on FDD, and, uh, um, and uh, what, you know, where this may go from here, what, what further follow-on can we expect. So, right. let, let me tell the same story from my end, because <laughs> as John and Merve were puzzled here, I was puzzled in Turkish parliament as a lawmaker with the main opposition, pro-secular Republican People's Party. And, you know, remember very vividly, you know, December 17th, the, the, the corruption scandal was a bombshell in Ankara. As Turkey's pro-secular main opposition, we knew that for the last year and a half at least, there was a crack within Erdogan's coalition uh, with the Gülen movement. Uh, and uh, when the corruption probe broke, we knew that that was going to be a messy divorce because uh, from the government perspective, from, the, from Erdogan's perspective, this was uh, the Gulen movements, you know, prosecutors, judges, police uh, officers going after Erdogan loyalists, and that this was basically a feud within the AKP. Now, from the secular opposition's point of view, uh, there were different ways to approach the issue. Most of my colleagues, and I think this was not a wise idea, just approached this as a corruption issue. And they thought corruption would be enough to bring down the AKP government. Now, as an academic who does a lot of sociological and anthropological work, who checks longitudinal surveys, I knew back then 
the Turkish electorate never cares about corruption. Corruption is never high on their list of priorities. To me, as someone who is very interested in foreign policy and security issues, this was the key issue here was basically treason. Can you imagine Turkish ministers, state bank officials on the payroll of, an, let's say, an Iranian operative, and Turkish officials providing various favors, money laundering, sanction busting, residency permits, citizenships, visa inter, uh, kind of, they, they were intervening to ease EU visa applications. Uh, moreover, uh, a, a political scandal. Uh, this guy, an Iranian operative, was paying, at least in one case, $183,000 for the poll that the AKP was conducting. So a Turkish political party, which happened to be the ruling party, was funded by an Iranian operative to run its day to their affairs. So I thought this was the line we should have taken, that this is basically about Turkish national security. This is a threat to Turkish national security. This is a threat to the Turkish political system. But we went after the corruption angle, and it didn't work. No surprises there. Now, from Ankara, uh, when I was looking at this whole playing field, the only institution which seemed to get what was happening was the FTD. In fact, I used FTD's research back then to uh, file a motion to set up an ad hoc kind of parliamentary committee. And now looking back at all this, I think the reason why FTD was the only institution that got it, besides the very able Merve's contributions and translations, is because FTD takes a macro look at this. FTD is on top of the Iran sanctions. And this is not just about corruption in Turkey. This is about Iran sanctions busting, basically, and how Turkey was an accessory, how the Turkish government, how the AKP, how the Erdogan government was an accessory to this. Now, why did they do it? You might wonder, why take such a risky step? I would argue several different motivations there. One is, the easiest one is personal enrichment. You know, everyone likes kind of a $50 million on the side. <laughs> sure. Uh, the, the political party benefits, you know. It's, it's great when you can build your, you know, party expenses to an Iranian operative. That's good, too. Third, let's remember that this was in the run-up to 2014 March local elections and August presidential elections. Erdogan, of all people in Turkey, knows best it's the economy, stupid, because Erdogan came to power in 2002 thanks to Turkey's worst ever economic crisis in history. And Erdogan had an economic downturn in March 2009 local elections. And he knew that economy could be his downfall. So in 2012, 2013, Erdogan did the math. He took a look at the figures. Turkey's exports, exports were in recession, were falling. Turkey's trade deficit was booming. It was off the charts, you know, over $100 billion a year. And this was the magic formula. In fact, this is not just my inference. This is also what Zarab says. This is also what Zarab was told to do. He was told to boost export figures. He was told to contribute to you know, solving Turkey's current account deficit, to serving tur tur solving Turkey's Which would be why deficit. they kept such accurate records of e gold exports. E exactly. Right. So everything was recorded to, to a surgical level. Let me sh prove this to you. In 2013, official figures show Turkey's trade balance to be 99.86 billion dollars and this is the year when there was you know uh, more than seven billion dollars of precious stones and metals exports so they pushed gold exports until the very last day to make sure that turkey's trade deficit would be under 100 billion dollars why because there were people like me in parliament ready to hit erdogan saying you brought Turkey's trade you know, uh, deficit to $100 billion in the run-up to local and presidential elections. Now, from our sources, um, among Erdogan's cir inner circle, we know that he was freaking out in July 2014, especially because he thought this is going to be the first popular election of a president, and it's the first two-round election. And he was complaining every day. He said, why did we do this? I won't make it in the first round. Who knows what might happen in the second round? So here is Erdogan with his existential fears of losing an election. And he needed 
all those cosmetic touches to Turkish bottom lines in 2012 and 2013 to also save basically uh, the, 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 perspe the, the, the prospects of Turkish economy. And one final footnote there, it also helps that uh, Zarab, a known philanthropist, has donated millions, tens of millions of dollars to quote-unquote non-profits, some of whom are closely linked, run, owned, operated by Erdogan's inner circle. And when I say inner circle, I'm not just talking about cronies and ministers, I'm talking about family members. So you do the math. When you put all of these together, it is extremely appealing. Yes, it is risky, but it's extremely attractive for Erdogan to go for this deal. You know, Eric, I, I would just add uh, maybe two other thoughts here. Number one, the gold trade on average and, and the illicit finance, the fictitious uh, invoices, probably amounted to about 1% of GDP uh, during the years that this was happening. Not insignificant. Uh, the other thing is, and this was really wild, in 2015, Reza Zarab gets an award from the Turkish uh, Exporters Assembly with Erdogan applauding in the audience. And, and they're lauding this guy for, uh, for, for basically being a hero for the Turkish economy. So if you have any doubt about how they view this, I mean, they were, they were really almost bragging about the fact that he had helped the economy grow. So Almost what's the reaction, back. you know, what's the reaction uh, been, what's been the blowback um, here on FDD uh, for all this, and what's the larger uh, impact on U.S.-Turkish relations? I kind of want to talk about your... Let me start. Uh, the, day, <laughs> <laughs> the, day was, the, the day Mark was going to testify as an expert witness, I woke up early in the morning uh, to the warnings from my colleagues, former students, that there was an arrest warrant for me. Now, how did that come about? Uh, Erdogan was in the crossfire that day. He knew this guy was going to testify in New York. That can't be good. And in Ankara, the main opposition party, CHP leader, Kılıçdaroğlu, promised that that day he was going to release all the offshore documents showing Erdogan's inner circles, families, accounts uh, in the Isle of Man. So Erdogan was thinking, oh, boy perfect storm, you know, from New York and Ankara. And then he said, oh, wait a minute. There's Icon Erdemir, an FDD senior fellow and a former CHP lawmaker. You know, I can hit two birds with one stone. So they had this rushed, uh, clearly rushed arrest warrant. They added my name to an existed, existing arrest warrant that day. Clearly, you can tell it from the arrest warrant itself because it has nothing to do with me. Uh, and that day, this was Erdogan's pushback, before, you know, pushback before the Turkish opposition could hit him and before Mark could start testifying uh, in New York, Erdogan had the arrest warrant. That was well coordinated with a smear campaign in the Turkish media. FTD from that point on was smeared as a terrorist organization. Um, all all the, you know, the, the, the members of FTD you see on this panel and others have been branded as you know, members of the the Fethullah terrorist organization. We've been referred to as a gang. Uh, we've been accused of uh, running the world, uh, not only being behind this conspiracy, but you know they say FDD runs the world. Uh, and That's good, actually. We, <laughs> use that for, we use that for fundraising. It's very helpful. <laughs> which, which then, you know, when I appealed, of course, when I appealed to the arrest warrant, uh, proving to them that all the accusations were wrong, you know, they accused me of being on the potential witness list, but it was not true. They accused me of supplying a fake uh, kind of investigative document from Turkey's banking regulatory agency, which was ki kind of crazy. Uh, the response was to uh, confiscate all my assets in Turkey. Yeah. So the Turkish courts don't take appeals very good. And ultimately, uh, this week, I also received a rejection of all my appeals. One problem, they sent, the courts sent, this is how meticulous Turkish courts are these days. They sent... Uh, the rejection of my appeal uh, to the wrong attorney in the wrong city, and my m name uh, was spelled wrong every single time. This is how carefully they're doing the work these days. And um, so at the end of this process, uh, you know, I ended up with uh, hundreds of uh, death threats, rape threats, torture threats, very graphic, you know, uh, AKP trolls telling me that they will decapitate me and you know, other, other things which I want to go into the details here. Uh, but ultimately, this is how Turkey functions today. That is, 
you deflect a problem, you know, corruption, espionage, treason, you basically deflect it by smearing, you know, uh, institutions, individuals, making up lies, using state-owned and pro-government media uh, to, for black propaganda uh, and through character assassination. Uh, though I have to have a footnote here, there was one day when Erdogan, I think, was, wasn't sure how to play this game. Uh, they had a good cop, bad cop moment uh, in Turkey's kind of you know, top circulating daily Hurriyet. Uh, th there's a columnist known for publishing uh, AKP press releases, uh, word by word. And so that was the only day, this was just a few days before Mark and John was to testify. They had enormous praise for these two individuals here. They said, you know, Mark Dubovitz, John Schanzer, they're the best in their field, experts, speak multiple languages, uh, and they said, we should not insult them, we should not use religious and racial slurs. You know, I, I think that was this good cup moment when, you know, the Turkish government wanted to see whether, you know, FDD could be willing to play it differently, but the next day, they were back to you know, all these slurs and insults and attacks and death threats. Um, I, I think it's very indicative of uh, the, the psyche, the political psyche uh, that the Turkish government is going through. And I'll just add that, that, it, that this was ex exceedingly difficult for us because we were under gag order from the Department of Justice. We, uh, we were not tweeting. We were on, on social media. We were not commenting about this case in, uh, in any way. So uh, we're watching Icon uh, come under fire. We're, our own reputations were getting smeared. Uh, we're on the front pages. I found, of the, I found the short jokes offensive to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did too. You I did, did too. too. I, yeah. I thought that was yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Was really yeah. below the belt. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about the implications, the broader implications for U.S. Turkish relations? This is a relationship that's obviously going through, in, in, I mean, long standing alliance relationship, but going through enormous turmoil now. Uh, just in the last few days, we've seen lots of discussion about uh, the relationship between U.S. support for the Syrian Democratic Forces and concerns uh, uh, on the part of Turkey about what, where that effort may be going. Lots of activity going on in Idlib province on Turkey's border. Um, lots of concern about, um, about which FDD has written before about uh, the networks of support. Uh, that foreign fighters have enjoyed in Turkey during the course of the Syrian civil war. A lot of ISIS fighters now uh, from other parts of the world, and particularly from Europe, finding their way home. The quickest way home is, in most cases, via, via Turkey, mostly via Istanbul. Um, where is this relationship after uh, this set of events, in particular this trial, sure. and, and what are the lasting what are the lasting sort of uh, next or implications and next steps that we're likely to see? Look, I, I mean, I think the, the first thing to point out is the utter disdain that the Turks had for our judicial system, um, and, and the way that they smeared the U.S. government. I mean, they, they're claiming this is a CIA plot that you know that uh, that basically was a coup attempt from the United States to bring down the government of Turkey. Then looking at the way that they, they treat their own citizens, looking at the way they treat American citizens, and obviously, we, uh, Mark and I got off lightly here. I mean, I, I look at, you know, there's a price on the head of, uh, of Michael Rubin over at AEI. We have Henri Barki here who's taken a, a good beating uh, from the Turkish government as well, being caught up in, you know, uh, you, you apparently plotted the whole coup, so congratulations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, so we, we see all this happening, and, and it obviously doesn't bode well for, for U.S.-Turkish ties that these sorts of things can happen. Uh, and by the way, I, I hold our government responsible for not responding in kind to the Turks. We're not holding their feet to their fire. We're not snarling at them and saying, you can't do this to us. Uh, on top of that, you know, let's just, you know, put it out there that you have upwards of $100 billion dollars. Uh, that the Turks uh, were, were helping to patriate back to Iran right at the height of the nuclear standoff, right at the moment where our sanctions mattered most. They're, uh, they're getting in the way of this. 
Now, on top of that, we've seen that uh, Turkey is now the uh, largest headquarters for Hamas outside of the Gaza Strip. Uh, we've seen al-Qaeda and ISIS activity across a very porous border until they closed it, I guess, about two years ago. But for really the, the first four or five years of the Syrian civil war, it was just a, uh, I mean, the barn door was open for, for jihadis to go back and forth, cash, uh, uh, antiquities, weapons. And, I mean, it was really, uh, it was the Wild West over there. Um, and then you see some of these things that are happening uh, at home, uh, the crackdown on the judiciary, the crackdown on the press. You get a distinct sense that we're really not dealing with a NATO ally any longer, that this is the unraveling uh, of a NATO ally. And um, I, I don't know where this goes, but I do know that the frustration that we felt in the early years as we were looking at this scheme, that we didn't, you know, Mark was talking about how the Obama administration didn't want to address this because of Iran. Well, they also didn't want to address it because of Turkey, because Turkey is so crucial to the fight against ISIS that it's the choke point for refugees, that we have the Indrilic Air Base and we have uh, sensitive assets that are based there in, in, in that air base. All these things have made it exceedingly difficult for American uh, decision makers to have that heart-to-heart -heart with Turkey. I would say that this trial is a very clear indicator that the time has come for a, uh, a sit-down for a, a clear understanding to be reached between our two countries. And if I could just add to that, Eric, I mean, the, the, as somebody who covers Iran, not Turkey, but for me, what's interesting about this case is that it, it, it demonstrated that there was something rotten in the heart of the Turkish banking system. Right? And you had Hulk Bank, but you also had other banks, other, other significant Turkish banks that were implicated in this. And so for international bankers uh, and companies who are considering doing business in Turkey, they have to be very concerned about the money laundering and terror financing uh, and sanctions busting risks of, of engaging with, with the Turkish banking system. And I think the implications are also pretty profound for international banks looking to do business with Iran. Because again, what this case demonstrated is that the Iranian banks and the Iranian government was, was deeply involved in, a, in an illegal scheme, um, schemes which continue to this day. And so, we're waiting to see what happens to Hulk Bank, but Hulk Bank and the fines or forfeitures or whatever the consequences will be will be another indication to international banks that if you do business with the Iranian financial sector, if you do business in key strategic sectors of Iran's economy that are dominated by the Revolutionary Guards and engaged in illicit financial activities, there could be significant penalties and consequences. So, bottom line, more to come, possible more more indictments, perhaps? Um, a lot of documents with a lot of names, a lot of companies. Possible further action by Treasury to uh, try and impose some, some costs, which could be have some knock-on effects on the Turkish economy um, and a very troubled U.S.-Turkish relationship. I want to go to the audience now for, for Q&A. We've got about 20 minutes for that. Ari Barkey. Since his name has been invoked, I think right. it's only fair to give him equal time. Okay. Mark, first of all, I wanted to know that we all have long ledgers for bribery, so Zarab is not unique. But jokes aside, the, what I don't understand is how do you get to $100 billion? You can, you can, the $13 billion in gold you can document, right? The question is $100 billion is a lot of money. It is an 80, what? My math is right. We're talking about $87 billion that you have to account for. And can you, do you have documentation? Do you know, I mean, this is a guess? Because just this fictitious um, uh, invoices, et cetera, will take you only this far. And you're also suggesting that there was that much money sitting in Turkish banks, Iranian money sitting in Turkish banks, which is also seems to me as a fairly large, large number. So I just want, you know, because yeah. especially in terms of understanding what the penalty will be eventually, it's important to understand the exact numbers. And I, I wasn't sure how you came up to it with yeah. 100. So as I mentioned, Henri, in our, my remarks, the 100 billion number, and it was actually, it was actually more, um, that number was an estimate from, um, from Turkish reporting and Turkish prosecutor report that came out. Um, as John said, our assessment may be that it's, it's lower, um, the, the, the one number that came out in the trial, Mervyn, and you can remind us of this, Zarab talked about a commission that he was paid. 
um, and was about what, one and a half percent? Yeah, it was about one and a half percent as part of this scheme. And he said he made something in the neighborhood of about $150 million, right? So, I mean, sort of do, do the math from there. Um, I mean, that, that suggests, that suggests, well, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing, doing it quickly, but basically. Also, a caveat here, yeah. an important caveat here. Zarab is just one of the players. That's right. So right. Iran clearly right. worked with, just in Turkey, with a, a number of uh, intermediaries. Right. Uh, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, and John has seen the numbers. They did a very professional distribution of kind of gold traders, meaning they didn't do all their trade through one person. So it was very neatly distributed, as if there was a quota system. And keep in mind, this is just Turkey. I know Turkey also tried to uh, be the intermediary for India and China. Interestingly, China said no. You know, uh, a NATO country asked China, can I be the, the, the sanction buster and money launderer for you? And China said no, out of prudence, and they wanted to do it through their own bank, but, uh, which I found you know, bizarre yeah. in general. But keep in mind, there were other countries, other intermediaries, other gold traders, so it's very difficult to yeah, measure. I, I think it, important to point out, there's, uh, there are two names to look at in Iran, Mehdi Shams and Babak um, um, uh, Zanjani. These are the two names that, that you need to look at. They were the sort of Zarab counterparts in Iran. The other thing to, to note here is that uh, Zarab testified that he continued to engage in sanctions evasion, sanctions busting, up until the day that he was caught by U.S. authorities. So that means that it, it didn't just end in 2012, 2013, when the gas for gold uh, uh, scheme was going on. You had the, the two or three years after that in terms of fictitious invoicing, and then another two years after that of a return to gold. And, and the, uh, the Turkish government has been somewhat open about this. So you look at that you know, uh, five, six year period for the Turks and then look at some of the other schemes that were taking place, not to mention some of the other banks. We're gonna learn about what went through, hopefully we'll learn what went through Dubai, we'll learn what went through China. Uh, I understand that there were some Russian banks that were involved in some of this. I've just seen some of the invoicing just on the fictitious invoices alone. In each of these, each of these, and, and, and there are piles of these transactions, each of them are 10, 12, 15 bil, uh, million dollars a piece, and there are stacks of them. Right, and, all these, and there's all these related schemes that didn't come out of trial, so which we, I mean, we can't talk about, but one, one imagines that this information will become public. And again, you know, the, the frustration that we have here is, you know, uh, A, we can't talk about some of this stuff, but B, um, you know, uh, it's not as if Zarab kept the, or maybe he did share with the DOJ what the total amount was, but I don't believe it came out in the trial from him. It didn't, but just to add one more thing to John's timeline, there was also the 2010 to 2012 leg of it where Zarab testified that they were smuggling tens of thousands of U.S. dollars outside of Turkey. This was when they were just smuggling cash not gold or fictitious food, but the actual cash and, and there are photos of it. And he said tens of thousands a day. So there's a, there's, there's a great photo, by the way. I don't know if it's been released by the Department of Justice, but uh, Zarab is standing next to a six foot stack of dollar bricks. Um, and he's just sort of got his arm around it and smiling. Um, you just get a sense of what was going on even before gas for gold. Yeah. All right, I think we had a question right here in the first row. Hi, thank you for the great panel. My name is Paul Massaro. I'm with the U.S. Helsinki Commission on the Hill. I'm the uh, anti-corruption advisor over there. Um, so we're really concerned about the spread of authoritarian styles of governance in Europe, Eurasia, uh, specifically a style of governance we've come to call kleptocracy, this idea that you could have sort of a, a popular strongman usually, a uh, crony network of some sort that's running all the major industries, maybe the media as well, um, and then massive offshoring of assets that it enables you to run this style of governance, right? Otherwise, the people would know or another thief would take it uh, or something like that. Uh, and, you know, again, we, we often associate that with Russia, but we're seeing it more and more in, in other countries. And, um, you know, I'm really interested to what extent this case demonstrates that Turkey is adopting some sort of style of governance or state's form uh, that is close to or uh, maybe... Uh, is <laughs> uh, the type of power, power vertical uh, kleptocratic governance we see in Russia. 
let, let me throw in another term. You know, I used to use kleptocracy to refer to Turkey. Then I found a better term, kleptotheocracy, oh, and which is what we, what we see not only in Turkey, but also in Iran. We, we simply have different sects. You know, the Turkish version is the Sunni kleptotheocracy, and the Iranian version is the Shiite kleptotheocracy. And often analysts and academics are kind of puzzled because they see the sectarian tensions. They see the, you know, the, the great Turkish Persian imperial rivalry over you know, hundreds of years. But they, feel t they, they fail to see one thing. There is, since 1979, there is one common theme that brings the Islamists on the both sides, you know, the Sunni and the Shiite versions of Islamists on the both sides together. And that is, you know, first of all, business is good. You know, when they're in government, they can profit from it. Second, you know, they might have different takes on Islam, but they all agree on bringing down, you know, the transatlantic system, the, 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 you know, the Western world. And this is, I think, this is how we can explain why Erdogan ultimately uh, worked with his Persian Shiite rivals, because he's very vociferous about, you know, Shiite expansionism and Pers Persian expansionism. Why did he fund that? Second, this also helps us explain how Erdogan, while shedding crocodile tears on you know, slain Syrian children and women in Syria, meanwhile was facilitating and enabling Iranian proxy war effort in Syria. And third, ultimately, you know, Erdogan's brand of Islamism in Turkey has a high reverence for the Islamic revolution in Iran. You know, since 1979, they have always been aligned with that regime, and in Tehran, when Tehran takes a look at the, the Sunni Islamists of the world, they have always seen, uh, they have always seen a, a good ally, a potential ally among the ranks of the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, you know, the, the Turkish version being Erdogan's version. So I think here we have two kleptotheocracies, which are engaged in a frenemy relationship. So uh, at some level, they're competing against one another for dom dominance in the Islamic world. But at the same time, they have a lot of common shared interests from personal enrichment to bringing down the Western world order. And that's the tragedy we're watching unfold. And I think their Achilles heel, I mean, at least in Iran, you saw this in the protests over the past uh, month or so. I mean, those people who were on the streets were blue collar workers, right, saying death to the dictator, uh, death to Khamenei, where's, where's my my paycheck, not so much where my vo where's my vote, the way it was in 2009, the Green Revolution. This was a, a blue revolution of people who were protesting against not only the economy, but also the corruption, the kleptocracy, the nepotism. Um, and, and, it's and the cost of uh, Iran's overseas ambitions. Exactly. And, and that certainly is, um, that's deadly for the clerical regime in Tehran, which talks a lot about justice. Well, in Turkey, it, it's the AKP is the Justice Party. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's interesting whether, how, will, will Turks tolerate that level of kleptocracy? Your, your point was, a few years ago, they were willing to. And that's what the survey data showed. Certainly in Iran, the survey data is showing that, that Iranians increasingly will not tolerate it. Let's move over to this side of the room for, for a question. We've got to come back to the other side in a minute. Um, you mentioned that Obama administration was reluctant to prosecute this case. Why did they arrest Zarab? And why did Zarab come here? So uh, the fact that the Justice Department arrested him, I think, demonstrates the independence of the judiciary. Uh, it shows that the system's working here in the United States. So you don't ask for permission from, uh, from the executive if you have uh, evidence against, uh, against someone. Um, as for the decision to come here, there are two schools of thought. Um, first of all, I, I, I still can't believe that he did it. Um, you know, that you come to the United States after years of brazen sanctions busting in the way that he did. Um, and he was such a well-known figure as well. The, um, the theories are that, A, he believed that because the Iran deal was signed and because the sanctions had, uh, in, in, in many cases had been lifted, that he was in the clear that he could come to the United States with impunity. That was sort of theory number one. Theory number two is that uh, he was um, in possession of a lot of secrets of some very powerful people. He was looking around at some of the other uh, sanctions busters 
specifically the ones in Iran, and how they had been brought to justice. They had been identified as having uh, stolen from the Iranian uh, regime. Zanjani was going to be executed. That's right. So he's looking around saying, wait a minute, maybe it's safer if I come to the United States and potentially plea out. Um, I haven't talked to, uh, to, uh, to Zarab, so I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but um, it would be fascinating to learn what his logic was. And I think the issue of the Obama administration, um, you know, whether or not they were greenlighting the prosecution or blocking the prosecution, I, I don't know. But the, the real question is back in 2012, 2013, why didn't they crack down on what was clearly a sanctions busting scheme? What, what was the reason? And, and there may have been. There may be lots of theories again for that. It may be because they, they didn't want to confront Erdogan because of all the U.S.-Turkey interests that were at stake. It could be because they didn't want to confront the Iranians because they were in back-channel negotiations with the Iranians through, through Oman. It could be that they didn't have enough, potentially enough evidence to, to crack down on these sanctions busters. We don't know. We don't know. This is all theorizing. Or, but or all of the above. All of the above. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go over to this side of the room, and then we'll uh, go to the back, and I think then we'll have to close out. I just want to know a little more about the back story for the U.S. Justice Department. It's not the judiciary that arrests. It's the U.S. attorney. You cannot get an arrest warrant without the U.S. attorney wanting it. So was this the U.S. attorney for the Southern District that decided to pursue the case on his own? And, and I'm a former Justice Department official. U.S. attorneys go and get their cases, you know, without ever telling the Justice Department. Did he do that? And if so, uh, you know, I'm curious because it was just like by fluke that the guy came here. So you're preparing this whole case and you're getting all this evidence together and you don't even know if you're going to get the dude. Marvin, you do you want to talk about Preet? Well. <laughs> and, and then where did he get his evidence before he came to you all? So uh, I don't know if, how he got the arrest warrant, but we know that the, it was the FBI agents who ultimately arrested Zarab at the, at the airport. Um, Preet Bahara became an instant celebrity in Turkey once, the, once Zarab was um, uh, arrested. The, the investigation goes back to, starts in 2010 and covers 2010 to 2016. So these are the things that we do know about um, what happened there. Um, we know that they had some, collected some of their own evidence, and by they I mean the FBI. We also know that they uh, worked with a Turkish policeman who was leading the investigation into Zarab and the bribe network that I mentioned from the December 2013 uh, scandal. So they had some of the evidence from the Turkish investigation that the police officer had brought in and shared with them. They also had some of their own uh, evidence that they had collected. They said that they corroborated, the, the evidence corroborated with each other, and then they had all the expert witnesses that they talked to, which included Treasury, OFAC officials like Adam Zubin and, and David Cohen. So um, this was what the, the case was built around. Um, I'm not sure about. It's, it's, it, but it's worth pointing out, I mean, we had the, the real honor of working with these ASAs and these FBI agents, and they are just, you know, incredible professionals. Um, obviously uh, meticulous and, and, and dogged in pursuit of this case. Really, uh, certainly for FDD, from FDD's perspective, it was just an absolute honor to work with these people. It's really the best of the best. I think we've got time for one last question in the back, and there's so many other questions. I think we may have to have, like, you know, part two of this panel <laughs> at some point in the future, so. I'm Bill Powell from Newsweek. Um, a question for, for you, Jonathan, and, and Ambassador, if perhaps you would weigh in on it. Um, I and several other people in this room were at a, a similar session at the Council a week or so ago. Um, and uh, Eric, one of your successors uh, as Ambassador to Ankara, was essentially saying that, look, we have to treat the U.S.-Turkey relationship now as we did during the Cold War. Um, and that is by emphasizing our interests solely, and our interests are security, security, and security. I mean, that essentially was his argument. And everything else, we have to suck it up and put it to the side. That's my words, my characterization, but that's essentially what he was arguing. Now, Jonathan, when you say we need to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart with the Turkish government, what are we going to say? What's the message? It's a great question, and, and I think it's about security. <laughs> I mean, if, what, if, if we're trying to contain Iran at the height of, of the nuclear standoff, 
and they are helping Iran get out of jail. We have a problem. If we are asking them to crack down on the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and other jihadi groups in Syria and they're leaving their border wide open and porous, we have a problem. They're not contributing to the security that we seek. That's the discussion. I mean, look, if, if you want to take a realist uh, perspective, which, which, by the way, I don't, but if you wanted to say, look, the issue of the crackdown on the Turkish people, the judiciary there, the, uh, the media, the, the lack of freedoms, you know, I, I, I suppose we've been hearing that in Washington for some time. I don't agree with that assessment. I think we should raise that as well. Uh, but I think the thrust of this needs to be that they are now actively working against the NATO principles, which, they, which we count on them to uphold. You know, um, I, I guess I would say that when, you know, if you look at the trajectory of the U.S.-Turkish relationship since the end of the Second World War, when the uh, Greek-Turkish aid bill was in front of the Congress in 1947, uh, then Under Secretary of State Acheson testified in kind of closed door testimony about the importance of aid to Turkey. And the issue was that the President had gone out in the Truman Doctrine speech and said, we're aiding democracies that are, you know, being um, uh, challenged by, by communism. And the question was, what kind of democracies were Greece and Turkey? And uh, you know, in closed session, Secretary Acheson said correctly, in my view, that Greece and Turkey were very imperfect democracies. And the relationship that we have with Turkey is obviously built on common interests, but it's also got to be built on values that we share. And the uh, trajectory since 1947 of that relationship has been incrementally, bit by bit, the United States trying to move Turkey, which at that point, uh, you know, uh, had not yet had a multi-party election in 1947, was to move the country as best we could, because we can't control it, ultimately Turks have to do this, in the direction of a more perfect democracy. Um, and I don't think it's sustainable for us to have a relationship that is just purely based on, you know, on interests, in particular when you have a government that is encouraging the most uh, rabid anti-Americanism you can imagine every day in the press that it now largely controls. Uh, and when it, you know, impugns and assails the integrity of current and former U.S. government officials virtually every day, I mean, including Henri Barkey, uh, your humble and obedient servant, uh, the outgoing U.S. Ambassador uh, John Bass, who's now been rewarded by going to Afghanistan as ambassador, um, you, you, and who is holding U.S. citizens in effect and former U.S. government employees, uh, Turkish national employees of the embassy, as hostages. I mean, President, I mean, Mervan and I wrote about this. President Erdogan, in effect, in so many words, said he would be willing to trade Pastor Andrew Brunson, a, a uh, Protestant minister who's lived in Turkey peacefully for 20 years, who's now been accused of being part of a terrorist organization, he was willing to exchange him for Reza Zarab. I mean, it, it's impossible, I think, to have a normal alliance relationship with a government that acts that way. I think that's the, I think that's going to be the last word. <laughs> But I want to thank our panel uh, for a really fascinating uh, hour.